Good morning. Welcome to worship at Newton Presbyterian Church. Welcome to worship on this Christ the King Sunday. I'm Ward Holder, the pastor here at Newton Presbyterian Church, and wherever you are worshiping with us, we welcome you to this time with our Lord. Let us now prepare ourselves for the worship of our living God. Greetings and welcome to worship at Newton Presbyterian Church. Please join me in saying together the call to worship, which is found in the bulletin. On this day, we celebrate the Lordship of our Christ. On this morning, we call Jesus Christ our King. Let all the faithful turn to our Lord and come to worship him in spirit and in truth. Please join in singing together hymn number 478, Praise my soul, the King of heaven. this time we are invited to come before the Lord and confess our sins. Please join me in saying together the prayer of confession, which is found in the bulletin, followed by a period of silent prayer. Lord, Christ, and our King, we come before you in sorrow. You have loved us even when we are not lovable. You have treated us as lost children and come and comforted us in our pain and loss. But instead of grateful praise and worship, we think that we are lucky and ignore the opportunities around us to spread your love. Teach us, Lord, to do your love, giving of ourselves to help others who are lost. Forgive our selfishness and open our eyes to your ways and your love. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Hear the good news. This statement is completely reliable and can be trusted in every instance. Christ Jesus died to save sinners. While we were yet in sin, Christ was born for us. Christ lived for us. Christ suffered and died for us. Christ rose for us today. Christ is praying to the Father for us. Brothers and sisters, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And as forgiven people, we are freed to live new and better lives. And our best guide to that life comes in the law of our God. They came to Jesus and said, What is the great commandment? He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and all your strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two depend all the law and the prophets. We know that when we are following these, we are walking in the footsteps of our God. This is the time in the service when we pass the peace. We miss this in our virtual space. So please, at this time, text or email someone in the congregation to let them know you're thinking of them. And next week, choose someone else. Peace be with you. As we prepare to hear God's word in the Holy Scripture, let us prepare our hearts and minds through prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come before you asking for your Holy Spirit. Grant us that same Spirit that inspired your prophets and apostles. Grant us that same Spirit that enlightens all minds to hear your true word. Grant us your Spirit so these ancient words become living anew in us, and we are led home to you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our responsive reading this morning comes from Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. Please follow along in your bulletin. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all of the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Our next hymn is number 142, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
our second reading comes from the book of Ephesians, reading the first chapter, the 15th through 23rd verses. Listen for the word of the Lord. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, which fulfills all in all. The reading for the sermon this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, reading the 25th chapter, the 31st through 46th verses. Listen for the word of the Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Just as you did it, to the, one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it unto, the, unto me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick, and in prison, and you did not welcome me. Then these will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it unto me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And may the Lord add a blessing to our hearing and understanding of this God's holy word. Amen. I love this passage, 
anyone who knows my teaching, knows my preaching, knows I come back to this again and again. Jesus tells those who love him what to do. But I have to admit that I never really paid attention to Jesus talking about the king. And I never really paid attention to the kingdom. You see, in, in the 34th, it, it begins with Jesus talking about himself as, as the Son of Man. And that's coming straight out of Daniel 7. It is words that a first century Jew would have understood as, ah, this is, this is something I understand. This is power. This is the one who will have dominion. But then at verse 34, he changes and begins talking about a king and a king who has prepared a kingdom and he wants to people that kingdom with people who are generous. People who give when they do not know to whom they give. People who reach out when there's nothing in it for them. The Christian church has a very long history of linking itself to kingdoms. The Christian church was linked to the Emperor Constantine. Uh, he believed that under the sign of this religion, he had conquered and so sought to be its guard. But of course, he would not allow for the church to criticize him. And the church accepted this deal. Uh, in Eastern Orthodox iconography, Constantine is known as the 13th Apostle. It did not end there. In the beginning of the 9th century, the Roman Church crowned, Const uh, crowned Charlemagne as Holy Roman Emperor and called the Kingdom of the Franks the Holy Roman Empire. And they did this because Charlemagne was powerful. It did not stop there. In the 13th century, the Pope, desirous of that power, promulgated an encyclical called Unam Sanctum, where he claimed that all power was under his own, own hands. Whether the power to wage war or the power to open the gates of heaven. Of course, the of course the American experiment has been a little different. We called this the new Israel. 
the governor of Massachusetts said, this is the shining city on the hill. We claimed we had to take this whole land because it was our manifest destiny. When the church claims kingdom power, the power of human kingdoms, bad things happen. We can see this in the number of times whenever the church said, God wills it. That was a battle cry. It wasn't a cry, we must go and feed the starving. It was, we must go and kill our enemies. God wills it. And again, the American nation has done a little different. to create room for good Christian people. We forced Native Americans on the Trail of Tears. And when that did not stamp out their culture enough, we, we formed Indian schools that would make them into good and true citizens, ones who did not have a competing religious or cultural allegiance. Christians supported slavery. James Henley Thornwell, a Presbyterian in South Carolina, preached the necessity of keeping slaves. Robert Dabney, who wrote one of the definitive biographies of Stonewall Jackson preached at the first General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States of America and said slavery was God's plan. Today, today, people, legislators who claim to be Christian make laws to make it illegal to give food and water to refugees. I'm reminded that the world is constantly trying to pin Jesus down and force Jesus into the models of kingship that we have. Pilate said, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, my king, kingdom is not of this world. Pilate didn't listen and neither do we. But Jesus keeps coming back and saying, this is the kingdom I am preparing. I am preparing a kingdom for people who give without counting the cost, who are generous without worrying about who they are helping, about people who treat others, those that he called the least, as if they are the highest.
rather than the lowest. Today's Christ the King Sunday. It's the very last Sunday in the Christian year. Next Sunday will be the first Sunday of Advent, where we join with, with Christians calling out, saying, Come, Lord Jesus, return to us. Except when Jesus returns, Anyone who has read the New Testament knows what he will say. So the question is, do we want to be the kind of people who Jesus will invite into his kingdom? with the grace of God and with changed hearts that allow us to see everyone as sisters and brothers. We will find the grace to help us become thou those kind of people. Amen. Now, let us continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. If you're a longtime supporter or member of Newton Presbyterian Church, you know that we are in our stewardship drive. Please return those to the head of our stewardship committee, Kathy Barnes. Otherwise, if you're simply here worshiping, there are ways to give. There's an app. There's a link on the screen. We still take checks. Let us return a portion of that which God so generously gives to us to the working of God's kingdom. As we prepare to pray, there are some prayer concerns that are still before us. We, this week we passed a quarter million dead from the COVID-19 virus. This raging pandemic has gone past 11 million cases and we are losing about 2,000 2, people just in America alone. So we need to be at prayer. Likewise, our country is still roiled by the divisions that are whipped up every day by those who would argue that the elections did not really matter. So we need to pray not only for unity, but that God will heal our land. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, we, we praise your name. We praise you that you have called us by the name of your Son and that you have taken us who were no people and made out of us a people. You have changed us from strangers into members of your family, calling us your children. So we come with confidence to you. We come knowing you will hear us, knowing you will take us in your arms, knowing 
that you love us. So we come praying. Lord, we lift up this deadly pandemic. We know far too frequently this has been simply a political football that people wanted to argue was an attempt to strike out at the candidate that they loved. Lord, with the election in the rearview mirror, heal us. Heal our hearts, heal our minds, allow us to pay attention to facts rather than our fears. Allow us to be generous and help those around us. Lord, we lift up our front line, all the various healthcare workers, all those who support them. They are exhausted. Lord, strengthen them, guard their families, guard them. Lord, we, we lift up that second line, whether principals or funeral home directors or businessmen and women or teachers. And we ask that you strengthen them, help them to make the decisions they have to make to keep people safe and yet do the work of this people. Lord, we ask that you would heal our land. We know we are deeply divided. We ask that you would allow us to see each other as sisters and brothers, children of one divine Father, rather than enemies. All these things, Lord, we pray in the name and for the sake of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us continue our worship with our affirmation of faith, saying together the Nicene Creed, which is in the bulletin and streaming on the screen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, 
who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us join together in our final hymn, number 144, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus. Now let us go forth. Let us live the lives our God asks of us and prepare ourselves 
with Christ's help, to be invited into his kingdom. And now may the grace, mercy, and peace of the triune God, creator, redeemer, and spirit that moves among us be with us all, both now, henceforth, and forevermore, world without end. Amen.